Okay, so let's look at Golang and cryptography. And we'll find that Golang is an excellent selection for implementing cryptography. Uh, one of the core advantages is that Golang uh, compiles to native code on most operating systems, whereas scripted languages such as Python will always be running slower. Along with this, uh, we don't have an intermediary uh, framework such as in Java and, and .NET. So the areas that we'll cover in the first presentation is to look at some basic formats, look at uh, the basics of symmetric key encryption, onto hashing methods, HMAC and HKDF, that's a key derivation function, some public key principles, and then we'll look at some the two core digital signature methods. So if we, we want to have a quick look at what a Golang program looks like, then what we'll find is that we have a package that we encapsulate the program. We then import our libraries. So these can be uh, generic uh, libraries that are part of the Golang framework, or we can import from uh, a, a place such as a GitHub. So for this, we use go and then we get, and we can actually get the library that we're going to integrate. So we can do that. And then once it's integrated, it will download the Golang code. And hopefully we can paste that in there. Uh, we can integrate the Golang code that uh, that's created. So I've already integrated this one, but this would normally be the way that we would integrate our code here. Once it's integrated, then we can then use the uh, methods that are exposed within inside of this. If uh, a, a, a method has a, a lowercase, then it's kept as private, where uppercase ones are, are publicly exposed. So there might be more methods in this uh, integration, but uh, they are not exposed because they could be defined in lowercase. But the great advantage of Golang is that we can easily see the source code uh, that's involved in these things. So we have a main function, and then we can have other functions that we can uh, integrate in with uh, our, our own code from there. Okay, and then we can pass in uh, some parameters uh, in, in here, uh, and we can define them with their data types, and we can then have our output parameters uh, defined here uh, from, from that. We can define the type that's involved in that uh, too. Our return uh, with inside our code will return our parameters uh, as required. So we have our variables set up, so we can add, either define these with a var uh, and then with the data type, or we can automatically uh, declare them uh, with the colon equals. This will automatically cast the type, in this case, message will be a string, uh, but we can also recast them uh, into uh, any data type that we want. Uh, here I've passed in some arguments to the program, but we, 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 we can either do that or we can have the inputs uh, uh, prompted within the code or read from data sources. Okay, so I'm using Visual Studio Code here, which is a useful method, and it allows us to be able to see the methods and how they're actually used. Uh, often we'll see a byte array, as in these ones here. Uh, and this is just an array of bytes this is the core uh, method that we use within inside cryptography to store our data structures. Uh, but uh, luckily, using uh, Visual Studio Code, we should be able to see all of the parameters that we require. When we're happy with the program, we do a go build, and then we will run the program with the run, and I just run here, and then we can test it like, like this. OK, but we also have an executable that we create. In this case, we've created an executable called AES uh, GCM that we can run uh, as a standalone program. OK, so obviously on a Windows machine, you would see an executable there, but I'm running it on a Mac, so it's creating a, 
a kind of Linux type uh, build for that. But when we do the go build, it will it will create an executable uh, for us. Okay, so that's the the basic elements uh, of it. And I'm not going to spend too long actually outlining uh, GoLang uh, setup itself. Okay, so that's the areas that we're going to look at. Uh, as I said, the the core methods that you might use is go get to get a certain uh, library, uh, go build and then go run from there. So in cybersecurity, we often define these actor roles, uh, Bob and Alice, and we need to make sure that uh, we keep things secure between Bob and Alice. We might also want to prove Bob's identity to Alice and vice versa. Unfortunately, we have Eve and Mallory uh, as other actors who might want to be uh, uh, malicious. Along with this, we can have uh, Peggy, who is a prover, and Victor, who is a verifier. So in areas such as zero knowledge proofs, uh, we can actually have a prover and then a verifier. So let's look initially at the basic formats that we have for our representation of our binary data. So initially we might have some sort of interpretation for the characters. That might be ASCII or 16-bit uh, uh, 16-bit characters. And, and then we interpret them uh, with defined uh, uh, character sets. We then encrypt these uh, or encode them and this will typically produce non-printable characters and these are in the terms of a byte array. We have bytes, uh, a certain sequence of bytes together will produce our ciphertext in this place. So we need some way to be able to interpret or read these values. So the two main methods that we use are hexadecimal or B64 uh, for, for these formats. We can send uh, keys or ciphertext uh, and so on through these two formats here and we'll be able to interpret them in terms of a byte array. But for the machine, all that really counts is this byte format here. So in the two formats that we have, we take uh, for hexadecimal, we take four bits at a time and then we convert it to a, a hex value. So in this case, we have one, two, a one and a four gives us five there. So we basically just convert four bits into our hex character there. And then each two hex characters represents one byte. So we would normally see our uh, hexadecimal values in a multiple of, of two. The other format that we have is B64 representation, and this converts a, a, a binary stream or a byte stream into a text format using a limited character set. So in this case, we have 64 different characters. Each of them represents a six bit value. So we split our uh, bit stream up into six bits and then we will represent the value uh, for the 6-bit value. So in this case, we have a 25, a 1, 2, 4, an 8, and a 16. Gives us 25, so we have a Z. We also have padding at the end of it. We need to make sure that we have multiples of four characters for the B64 format. So if we don't end up with enough bits to fill all of those four character multiples, then we pad with an equals. We also pad with zeros at the end to make sure that we have uh, enough bits to fill all of the uh, character representations. So we just have a quick look at what that looks like in terms of our Golang code. So we'll just open this up, open folder, and we'll look at our formats here. Okay, so here we are, we're just using some standard uh, integrations such as the hex integration to, to convert. And I'm just going to take a hash value of a string and then we'll try and represent that in terms of hexadecimal and also in terms of B64. 
So one way we can do this is to use the percent %x uh, representation for uh, our printf statement. So this will take the string, convert it into a byte array, and then show it as a hexadecimal string. With this one, we will use the hex encode to string method, take the byte array again, and we'll, this time we'll show it as a string because the output of this is a string, a string of characters. For base64, we can use the encode to string, and again, we can show that as a string method uh, here. Okay, so we'll just uh, give that a run there uh, to see how we, we get on. So we'll just go build, and then we'll just run that to see what we get. And we can see here, there is our uh, string. This is the representation of the string in hexadecimal. 68 is an H, uh, 65 is an E, and so on. Then we can convert the string that we're entering, hello, into a hex, a uh, base64. So we should find there's four, and then there's four, so the equals is a padding there for the bits. And then we'll take a hash of that. We'll explain hashes later on. We can see the here is our hex and our base64, and this is a bigger hash that we have. We can see how it's created either a hex value or a base64 value. Okay, so in this way, we can actually create our our hex and, and base64 outputs. The other element that we have with inside cryptography is that we often deal with what are called big integers. Normally in a program, we have 64-bit or 32-bit integers. With inside cryptography, we might have 128, 256, or even right up to 4096 bits. They can't really be represented in a normal data formats and they wouldn't fit into our registers. So we create uh, big integers and these are defined normally in a string value and then there'll be certain mathematical operators that will operate on, on these. And we can see the numbers become very large as we, we increase these values here. So what we normally do is we convert our integer values into a into uh, integer values into a big int or a string a value for our representation of decimal or, or hex into a big integer. Once they're in, then we can use add, subtract, multiply, expo expo ex exponential. So that's g to the power of x, and then we can multiply and we can even do the mod operation. The mod operation is the remainder after a, a division. Okay, so let's have a look at that uh, code there to see what our, our integration looks like. So here is our, is our big integers. I've just used a little method here to convert from a string into a big int, uh, but obviously we can just, just uh, integrate that on its own. Here's a standard way that we might uh, integrate a value. Let's say the value of 10 and base 10, and we'll call it x form there. And you'll find in Golang, we need to use our, our uh, uh, variables if we've created them. So I'll just print that one out just so that um, we can have something to display, percent %d is for an integer, is for a string, s, percent %s, and we'll put a new line, and x4. In this case, we can see that the little error goes away from there. Uh, in this case, set from a string. Uh, we can also set from an integer. So that would be in terms of that. And we, we don't need the, the base 10 anymore from there, and and so on. So there are various ways that we can convert from something unsigned int, from bytes, from a byte array, from bits, and so on, and they convert into our bink int value. So once it's in, uh, we can then use our, our maths functions uh, to be able to convert. So we can have new big int, there 
and then this should show us all the different methods that we have. So let's say we wanted to use um, multiply, and then we can have multiply x1 and x2, and we should be able to see the format here for that. Okay, the one thing that differs here is that we can see this uh, this here for our um, uh, explanation explanation will give us a mod value so it's x1 to the power of x mod the prime number here so that's equivalent to x1 to the power of x2 and then we would often define that as mod of a prime so that's the uh, remainder after division by the prime and it creates a finite field uh, for us. In cryptography, that's what we normally do. We normally have a finite field in terms of a prime number. So we never have a value that's equal to the prime number or above that. Everything is, is below that, between zero and that prime number, minus one. Okay, so that's, that's uh, one thing that we can uh, look for. And uh, for some of the other ones, we can just subtract and add and, and so on. Uh, one to look out for is this mod inverse. That's the inverse of x2. So I like a divide uh, mod the prime. So that's equivalent to saying x2 inverse. I'll just define it as minus 1 just now. It's like the divide operation by x2. And we would do that in terms of mod of the prime number uh, in there. Okay, so this is the this is the way that we would uh, often look at our uh, our methods here. We'll just go and build that and then run it and see what we get. Okay, so there's a prime number 127 uh, in there, and we can see here the values that we've got defined in hexadecimal and so on, and we can define our operations. Okay, so big enough integers will be slower than our normal uh, mathematical operations, but it will allow us to do very complex uh, calculations. So the first core concept that we're going to look at is asymmetric key encryption, which is really the workhorse of, uh, of cryptography, and it allows us to keep our data secret. So for this, what happens is that Bob and Alice have the same shared key, so there is some way that they can get a key to each other. Uh, that can be done through key exchange or they could generate a shared secret using a password or something like, like that. We encrypt with one key and the same key can then decrypt. We have ciphertext in between and then hopefully Eve can't decrypt the ciphertext unless she has the secret key. So the first concept that we have with symmetric key is what's known as a block cipher. So for this, we take our data and we chunk it up into smaller elements. Uh, a typical block size is uh, 16 bytes or 128 bits. Not all ciphers are like this. Uh, DES has a 64 bit or an eight byte uh, block size, but AES and most of the other ones that we have these days are 16 bytes. We take each of the message blocks, we apply a key, and we also apply a salt value typically to create uh, our output. We then build all that back up into a cipher block. So the salt is required because we need to make sure that for the same uh, plain text, we end up with a different uh, cipher text. This salt must also always be stored alongside the cipher so that we can actually be rebuild, uh, we can decrypt using the salt and the same secret key. So when we're decrypting here, all we do is we take the key and the salt back, we take our cipher blocks and we should be able to reverse it back into the message again. For the last uh, block, we might not be able to, or it's highly likely, we wouldn't be able to fill all of the last block with 16 bytes, so we add on a pad or we pad some bytes at the end when before we encrypt and then on the other side after we've decrypted we'll remove the pad so the pad gets added to pad out into the 16 
bytes, uh, blocks in this case. We then encipher them. At the other end, we decipher and then we remove the pad. If you ever see characters at the end of a, of a pad, uh, end of a string that's been decrypted, you know that there might be the chance that we haven't stripped off the padding bytes. So the standard method that we use is PKC uh, S7, and that will pad with a value equal to the number of bytes that we pad. So if we have 10 characters and we have six spaces left, we will pad with 06060606060606. 06, and the other side will be able to uh, remove that. Okay, so let's have a look at that uh, padding example from there. So we'll just see if we can find that. So here's our block. Okay, so in this case, I'm bringing in this library here. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm going to pad the message. So in this case, let's say it's hello. So that's one, two, three, four, five. So we've got 11, 11 missing values. So we should see a value of zero B, which is 11 padding in there. Okay, so we'll just give that a try. Just let me save that just in case. It's not been saved and we'll build that. Okay, that's, that's fine. And then we'll run it, see what we we'll get. Okay, so we can see here, there's the padding there. And we've padded with a zero B value. And when I unpad, you can see the unpad comes through and there's no padding bytes in it. If I make this now that, and just save that, then you should see the value change, now it's zero six. What will happen is that eventually we'll break out of one block and then go into the next one. So you should see the cipher increasing and doubling its size here uh, as we move on to the next block. And we can see that's the case there. So it's filled one block and then we have the next block coming along and there are the padding bytes in there. Okay, so we've got to remember to pad and unpad if we're using a block cipher there. The other, the other type of cipher that we have is what's called a stream cipher, and these are highly efficient ciphers and very fast, and indeed much, much faster than a block cipher. With this, we take our key, we take a salt value, sometimes known as a nonce or an initialization vector, and those together will create a pseudo infinite key stream, key stream that goes on forever or however many bytes that we want to use it for. And what we do is that we take each bit at a time and we do an XOR. So if you ever saw an XOR, you would know it's this operation here, used a lot in cryptography because we never lose any data when we apply XOR. So we take each bit one at a time and we XOR. So a zero and a one gives us a zero, a one there, and so on. The advantage with this is in real time, we can actually see the data coming through and we don't have to wait for all the blocks to, uh, to, to, to come through. At the other end, we just do the same. We, we generate the same uh, uh, key stream. We take the cipher text, we XOR them together, and we should create our plain text back again. So popular stream methods are RC4, ChaCha20 is very popular these days, and there are modes of uh, GCMAS uh, that allow us to create a stream cipher. So let's have a look at one of those examples, uh, and we'll see if we can find our ChaCha20 example. Here we go. So what we should find is that ChaCha20 produces the same length of cipher as our plain text, unlike our block ciphers. Okay, so we'll just uh, get that running. And just see if it's running. Okay, okay, so we're just gonna create uh, our new cipher here. And we'll just try and run that from there. 
Okay, so we can see here there's the um, uh, there's the message. I'm going to use a passphrase to be able to generate the uh, uh, the the key with a nonce value. That's and then together they'll create that. We create our cipher stream here, and then can decrypt it. So it's much much faster than our than our block ciphers. So we get various modes that we can apply for our ciphers. Uh, AEAD is uh, authenticated encryption with additional data. Our block ciphers and our stream ciphers. So when we use say, AES encryption, one of the most popular, we can actually apply a, a, a given mode to it. So for our block ciphers, the ECB, and CBC are very popular, but for us stream ciphers we can have CFB, OFB, counter, and GCM. GCM allows us to have this authenticated uh, in encryption, and I'll explain that uh, in a little minute. Okay, so with ECB, uh, basically we don't have any salt value here. Basically we take the message blocks, encrypt with the key, and we create our cipher block there. The problem with this is that the same cipher, the same message will give us the same cipher block, so it will give away uh, a good deal of information. With cipher block chaining, we take the salt, we XOR it with the message, and then we encrypt, and we take the output of that and feed it into the next encryption block, and so on, and it chains through uh, from, from there. The other method that we can have is uh, authenticated encryption with additional data. In this case, we take additional data, such as something that ties the cipher in, such like a session ID or a TCP port and so on, so that Eve can't play it back. We add in the salt value and the key, we encrypt and we create the cipher text and we also need to send the salt value to Alice. Alice will take the salt value that's been sent the authenticated data that's associated with the cipher, the key, and she should be able to decrypt the data. And this is an excellent mode, and it's used fairly extensively now uh, within the industry. Uh, so GCM is, is the most uh, likely to be used uh, method uh, for encrypting files and, and so on. Okay, so we'll just have a look at some of these methods here. So in this case, I'm encrypting with GCM, ASGCM, CBC, and also with a stream cipher here. And we'll look at the difference. So for CBC, it's just a plain old, uh, let's pad and unpad our block cipher, and then we encrypt the blocks from there. For GCM, we create what's called a seal, we can take our additional data, which would go in here. So if we had some additional data, it would be added here, but I'm putting in a nil just now, and it's a salt value, and also for the key that we're gonna use. And then the advantage with GCM is that we'll get an exception if the parameters don't tie up. And then for a stream cipher, we use an XOR stream for the, the, the encryption, and also for the for the decryption. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. We're using CPC, so we'll just make sure that's gonna work. So go run main.com, this would give us our CBC, and we can see here for our stream cipher, then the length of the cipher is the same as the, the length of the plain text from there. Uh, add in our salt, and we should be able to decrypt it. Uh, for GCM, uh, we can try that one out. And just using a little if statement here. Uh, Golang doesn't need or doesn't like these brackets around there, <coughs> so we can leave them off. Uh, we'll just save that and build it again and then run it. And this is our GCM mode. And there. Uh, uh, there's more data uh, stored within the cipher. It's not just the uh, the message, but there is also authentication data and a tag to authenticate it. 
So that's why that cipher is longer than the actual message. But the actual encrypted data is in there and it's the same length as our as our message. Okay, so that's that's our three main modes that we would use. Most of the time it's AES that we would use and GCM is the is the most likely one these days to be used. Okay, so that's an example there uh, for that. We can also generate our key from a password. So in this case, we're using a key derivation function or KDF. PBKDFS DF2 is a very slow method, which means it's more difficult for Eve to, to hack. So in this case, we generate a salt value for that. We'll take a salt, a password, and we'll generate the encryption key. As long as Alice has the same method on her side for generating the key with the salt value, then she'll be able to create the same uh, a key. Remember, the, the salt will differ uh, in the salt that we're using for the encryption. We'll use a salt value for the password uh, there too. Okay, so this is just an example there. We're creating AES GCM and the encryption key that we're creating is actually based on this PBK DFS2. Okay, so there's a CBC encryption with our block cipher on padding and unpadding. And here is a stream cipher with XOR uh, of the stream. The next concept that we'll look at is uh, known as hashing. With hashing, we want to create a digital fingerprint for the data that we have. So in this case, we take hello, we put it through a hash, popular hash from the past is MD5. We create a hash and that creates a digital thumbprint. Unfortunately, it's fairly easy to map the hash back to the, uh, the data. Uh, it's a one-way function and we shouldn't be able to mathematically go back the way but normally what happens is that we can create a hash table and have the hash mapping to the original data. So it's easy to actually find out the data, uh, uh, the original data. So often what we do is we add some salt value. We take the, the input data, we add a salt value onto it, concatenate normally, and then we will create a new hash, which is more difficult for Eve to be able to determine the original uh, message, especially if this is a password. So for that, we need to store uh, the salt value that we've actually used uh, in, the, uh, in the actual uh, salting process for the hash. Okay, so with MD5, uh, we have a 128-bit hash, which gives you 128-bit uh, a value here. There should be 32 hex characters uh, in there or 16 uh, bytes uh, overall. So you can see here a change of, of even just one bit or one character creates a completely new hex value from there. We can represent it also in a base 64 format if required. So it'd be hex or, or um, a base 64. For 160 bits, it's a larger hash in that SHA-1. We can see it's a longer one uh, in there. And for this, um, we, we will use 20 bytes in there, or 40 hex characters to represent the hex value. So let's have a quick look to see what that looks like in, uh, in Golang. So just find there. And we'll find our hash value from here. There we go. Okay, so I've integrated some hash values here: argon, bcrypt, Blake two, MD four, and so on. Uh, also, SHA two five six, and so on. Uh, this is the way that we create our hashes here. We, we operate on a byte array and create a hash value from there, which will be a fixed length of hash depending on the hash type that we actually have. You see this this one, 32 bytes. This one gives us 64 bytes for a 512 
uh, hash there. Okay, so we're just going to generate some salt values and then we can output them uh, from there uh, for that. Okay, so just make sure that's running. Okay. And there we go. So for the input of ABC in MD5, we get this hash value. If I change that to capital A, we should get a completely new hash value from there for our, M our all our hashes and, and it has. Okay, so those uh, those are this is a standard hashing method. So with our hash, what happens is that we can just change one bit, or in this case, one character, and it will completely change the hashed value. That, that we get in there. So we're only getting rid of the S here and it's completely changed the hash value. Okay, so there's the examples in Golang to be able to create each of our hashes. And we can also check our hashes with an external program using uh, OpenSSL to, to actually do that. So here's an example of creating a hash of a message using uh, MD5 for Linux and also for Windows. You've got to watch that sometimes you've got hidden characters that you don't see and even a space actually matters for the hash value. So the different types that we have is that MD5 still widely used in some applications but really it should be deprecated because what happens is that we can have two different data uh, elements and it's possible to create what's called a collision between the two the hashes of the two of them. And it can even happen that the hash of an executable file or an email message can actually still create the same MD5 uh, 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 hash value. So we shouldn't really use MD5 and Google showed that it was possible to create a SHA-1 hash collision within a reasonable amount of time. So SHA-1 shouldn't be used either. Where we are just now is to use the 256-bit or 512-bit hashes. SHA-256 is SHA-2, is SHA, is SHA and it's a new method, uh, and we can also get SHA-512. Uh, NIST created another competition for, an, for a completely new type of hash, and uh, they created the SHA-3 format from there. An extremely fast hashing method is Blake2, and we can have that in two forms of 256 or 512. So these are the hashing methods that we will use, and they create a fixed length of hash uh, that we require. We can also create a variable length of hash uh, of 16, 32, 64, 128 bytes. It really all depends on, on the size of the hash that we want. Uh, shake128, uh, and uh, sort of shake uh, two five, shake one two eight and shake five one two are two methods derived from SHA three that allow us to create this output. We can also use Blake XS and Blake XB to be able to create a variable output there. So I'll just show you those two hashing methods. Yep. Okay. Uh, so shake one to eight and shake two five six here, and we can define the length that we want. So let's say we want to create uh, one hundred twenty eight bytes. So we would feed in one hundred twenty eight bytes uh, in here, and this will allow us to create that output. In GoLang, we can parse our output to a certain length by using this expression here, but the output here will be 128 bytes of, of our hash value based on uh, an input string and also of, uh, well, of the, the input string. We can also add a salt in there if we need, but we'll get 128 bytes out of this one here, hopefully. Okay, so we'll just give that a run. 
and there we go so that's created a, 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 the the output hash of our our requirements that we would have there if we cut this down to just 16 let's see if we go for eight bytes then we should see a big difference in our output okay we're only getting eight bytes of an output so x OF is a useful method to be able to create a certain length of our of our hash uh, output. Whereas if we want a fixed length of output, we'd use our normal hash functions. Okay, so there's the the method implemented there. The next area we're going to look at is what's called uh, H Mac and H key derivation function. Okay, so this will allow us to be able to uh, sign or verify messages uh, that we actually uh, create. Okay, so with a keyed hash message authentication code or HMAC, what happens is that we have a secret key and we sign or we, we, uh, we verify the message by taking a hash of it in SHA-256 in this case and then use our secret key to create our HMAC. So this message can go along and we can we can add the HMAC uh, to it. When Alice receives the message, she takes a hash of hello. She then adds a secret key that her and Bob actually have, and then we'll create our own HMAC and then compare it. If the two are the same, she knows that, that Bob has the secret key and she also knows that it was Bob the message that was sent was the original one, that was the one that she's received. If Eve comes along as part of the session and tries to send uh, Alice some messages, then Eve should not be able to generate the same secret key here. Normally this is done with in a session where we can negotiate the secret key for that session. Every session that we connect to will create a new uh, secret key from there. So let's have a look at uh, some HMAC and see what it looks like in, in code. If I can find it here. HMAC, there we go. Okay, so I'm bringing in HMAC here as a library. Uh, I'm just gonna use a, a, a hexadecimal key here just so it's easy to use and here's the message that I want to send. I'll then uh, create our, our secret key which is a byte uh, array here and then we'll uh, use SHA-256. We, we can use any hashing method here that's available and then we'll use our secret key to be able to create the hash of it and then just write that out from there. Uh, again, our output is uh, in terms, in this case, of a hash. So that will be a string value that that we output. So we'll just see what that looks like from there. So there's the, the message. This is our encryption key that we're using between Bob and Alice. There's the, the HMAC, the two different HMACs. And then we should be able to, to validate that that they match when we, when we receive that okay so that's the hmac and we can expand that uh, even more in terms of using hmac and a key derivation function so let's say that bob and alice want to create the same encryption key from some salt value and also from a secret not necessarily from a password but it could be some other randomization that uh, bob and alice are uh, uh, can share. So in this case we take the secret, we take the salt and now we create uh, an HMAC based on the secret to create our uh, HMAC key derivation function. So Bob creates that key, uh, has some way for Alice to get the same secret and same salt value and then we can use that encryption key for our encryption and then also for our decryption. We can see here that uh, we're creating our key based on this uh, secret 
the salt value, we can also add in some other session information if we want to that Alice and Bob would uh, negotiate. And this is the hash method that we're going to use, SHA256 in this case. We'll create a key of a certain size. We'll then use encryption to be able to, uh, to uh, uh, encrypt the data from, from Bob to Alice. So let's see if we can find an example of this one. There's our key derivation function. Okay, so there we go. Uh, so I'm bringing in each uh, key derivation function here. Uh, this creates our secret value. It's just a string. I'm just using a string here. Uh, it might be a, a phrase. I'm going to generate a random salt value of a certain length. That's equal to the length of the hash. And then what we'll do is we'll put all of that in uh, together and we'll create our encryption key that we're going to use from there. So let's see if we can run that one and see what we get for our, our output. Okay, so Bob and Alice now have this as their encryption key. So if we change that slightly then what we should find is that the encrypt the encryption key will com completely change. So this is normally the way we generate an encryption key. We don't generate it with SHA-256 because it has a flawed method in there. Okay, and in TLS and, and communications, we, are, we often use this method to generate the encryption key for the tunnel that we're going to use. Now let's look at a very important area of public key encryption. Public key encryption is often used to prove the identity of Bob to Alice and, and vice versa. So we'll often use it in terms of them identifying each other. Also that uh, Bob can uh, prove that he signed uh, a, a message uh, from, from that. So the, th the basics of it is that we have a special mathematical method we, uh, to create what's called a key pair, a public key and a private key. And these keys work together. So we can encrypt with one key and we can then decrypt with the other key. In symmetric key encryption, we use the same key. But in this case, we use two different keys. This would allow Bob to send Alice an encrypted message by encrypting with her public key and then she would decrypt with our private key. The three methods that we typically use these days are RSA, which was the first method to be discovered for public key encryption. And this is the method here. We create a modulus based on the multiplication of two prime numbers. The difficulty is to be able to factorize them back again. We then create this value of phi, which is P minus one times Q minus one. We pick D which is the inverse of the value of E that we pick, uh, mod phi. Uh, if we have the value of P and Q, it's easy for us to compute that. This is our public key and our private key. We then cipher a message by raising it to the power of E and then take mod N and we get the plain text back by taking the cipher to the power of D, uh, mod uh, uh, N. With our gamma, we use discrete logs we take a generator value, such as two or five, and we raise it to a secret value of x. And again, we take the mod of a prime number. Prime numbers appear lots in public key encryption. And most of what we do is that we constrain the values that we have between zero and p minus one. This is known as a finite field. And we make sure that the prime is big enough so it's not possible to discover the secret values that we, that we have. So in this case, our secret key, our private key is X and our public key becomes the value of Y. G uh, is our generator. We raise it to the power of a secret, take the mod of P. Shouldn't be possible for us to discover X knowing Y. The most popular public key method uh, these days is elliptic curve cryptography. And with this, we create a curve such as this we have a finite field, which is much smaller than the other two methods that we looked at, typically 256 bits. Our secret key is a random value, typically 256 bits, and our public key is a point on this elliptic curve, given a generator point. 
that's our secret key, our private key, and then this is our public key. Okay, so this is RSA here. We generate two random prime numbers of a certain size. We work out the modulus of them, P times Q. Cipher is, is M to the power of E uh, mod N. This is P minus one and Q minus one. We'll calculate phi here. And then we'll, multiple, we'll then find the inverse of E mod phi to find D. And this allows us to, to decrypt there. So let's see if we can find our RSA, simple RSA method here. Here we go, it's this one here. Okay, so we're dealing with big integers here because this is going to get very, very large. Uh, the value of E we typically use is 65,537. From there, uh, I generate uh, two prime numbers here of a given size. And in this case, they're just small prime numbers, 64 bit, we'll make them 128 bit. So our modulus will be 256 bits long here. Okay, and then this is P minus one, Q minus one gives us phi, D is the inverse of E mod phi, and this is our decipher there. So fingers crossed, hopefully for the message of 10, uh, as an integer, we'll be able to recover that back. We'll just make it 12 just to make sure that it's working okay. So let's go and then we'll just bring up our terminal. We'll just build that one and then we'll run it to make sure it's running. And fingers crossed, we can see there, we get the recovery there. P and Q and M, there's E, and D is inverse E mod uh, e e phi. I've not shown phi there, but phi will be in the same sort of size as, as N there, but obviously will be a smaller value than that. There's the cipher, uh, and then there's we the cover of the plain text there. So next we can look at uh, El Gamo. So El Gamo is quite popular these days again, but uh, not so popular because of the elliptic curve. Uh, the prime number values are normally greater than 1024 bits. So they get quite large, so it gets quite computational intensive. Uh, if you're interested, that's the private key or the secret key, that becomes the public key. We have two values for the encryption A and B, and then we can decrypt by uh, performing this operation. This operation is an inverse mod, again, of uh, we do inverse of A to the power of X mod P gives us this divide operation. So let's see if we can see an El Gamo method in Golang, just to see how this actually works. And there we go there, El Gamo. Okay, so in this case, I've pre-computed some keys here to make it much faster. And um, we can see the encryption process and there's the decryption. There's the mod inverse of that value that we just saw. And hopefully there's the, there's the generation of the public key. Uh, G is the generator point. Uh, X is our private key. And P is the prime number that we're actually using. And in this case, we'll get the program to be able to generate the, uh, uh, the, the generator value and also uh, the prime number from there. Uh, and we can generate that like that okay so hopefully once we run this program then it should be able to encrypt and decrypt oops just let me uh, rebuild that one okay And uh, so when we get uh, values such as this, uh, in this case, it's to do with the with my arguments there. I, I, if I had arguments on the program, it would be able to run <laughs> from there. Uh, and I would normally check the number of arguments in the program. But uh, now we should be able to run this program using static variables. 
Okay, so it's actually worked. In this case, there's the string that we're going to use and uh, everything's worked okay there. Okay, so that's Elgamo and the, the, when we look at homomorphic encryption, we'll find that Elgamo is very useful. The main method that's used these days for public key encryption is elliptic curve cryptography and it's, it gives us very small keys, very small signatures and, and so on and highly efficient on a range of devices. And basically what we have is an elliptic curve which might be in the form of uh, this, uh, ax plus b mod p and we have a 256 bit prime number um, in its analog form here we end up with a curve that looks like that. In terms of the finite field with the mod p, we end up with little dots um, that relate to points. But in an elliptic curve, when you add one point to another point, you always get a point on the curve, so we can keep checking. With this, we have a private key and a public key, and we have a g, a generator point. The generator point is the point, the base point on the curve. What we then do is we add points together. So if we wanted to create 2G, we might get a point here, and then 3G might be another point, and, and so on. Uh, what we have is that we have a secret key and a generator, and our public key becomes SK times G. Uh, we take the base point and add it SK times, and we shouldn't be able to reverse back the value of the secret key, even though we know P and and uh, and G. So this shows an example of an elliptic curve. This is the elliptic curve that's used in Bitcoin and Ethereum, sept 256K1. There's the prime number, and there's the A and the B value. Uh, we have our base point. We also have the order. When we're doing mathematical calculations, we do it in terms of mod of the order and not of the prime number. The order gives us the number of, of possible points on the, on the x-axis for the curve that we have. But other curves include curve 25519 and so on. So this is what it looks like. We end up with little points. There are two points for every x that we can have to solve this type of equation. So we don't end up with the curve that we would normally have, but we end up with a whole lot of points and when you add them together, we get another point in the curve. Obviously, if it's 256 bits, we'll have uh, a very large number of points that we can uh, pick from. So these are the standard curves. This is the one used in Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, but we also can get P256 and Curve 25519. If we used fly Curve 25519, we can have uh, ED DSA 219, and for key exchange, we can have X25519. With signatures, uh, we can get ed DSA with the elliptic with uh, sept two five six k one, and for key exchange we can get ECDH elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. We can also create larger, more secure curves such as P five two one, or curve uh, A four four eight, which leads to these uh, signatures. These have much larger prime numbers in them. So there's a base point. We then have our equation. Uh, we define our secret key as a scalar value, 256 bits typical, and we end up with a public key, which is a point on the curve. So typically 512 bytes bits for our public key, for our X and our Y value. We also add on another byte, typically a 04 at the start of it to identify that it's a public key point. But the main operations are point add and point double that's the core operations that we have with elliptic curve. So finally, let's look at digital signatures. With this, it's possible for Bob to take a hash of the message, just like with HMAC. Now we can use public key encryption that we don't need the same shared key, but Bob can now sign a message with his private key, encrypt that hash with that, and then Alice can then prove that hash by decrypting the hash and proving uh, the message. This proves that Bob was the signer of the message, also that uh, it, the message hasn't been changed by anyone. 
So with ECDSA, what we have is a hash, we have a private key, and we also have a nonce value of K. We then use them together to create a signature, which is a value of R and S. That R and S value that will then prove that the right private key has been used with this message. Alice on the other end uses uh, Bob's public key, the R and the S value and the hash of the message to prove the signature value. These are the maths used. We take the nonce value, create a public key point of R, and then we take the inverse mod. This is all done mod of the order. Uh, and then we create this calculation. And then the other end, we use this part to be able to prove that signature. So let's quickly look at what this looks like in code uh, for our equation. Okay, so in this case, we're getting a, a curve. So the curve type in this case is, is coming in as a string uh, for that. Yeah, so we're going to use this curve. So if we wanted, we could, we could just manually put that in there to give us uh, our sept, our P256K1, which is our sept curve. Uh, this is our message. We're taking the hash of the message. We're going to generate our key pair here with a private key uh, for this curve and with a random value. And then we can generate the public key, which is SK private key times G will give us this point value here. We can sign to give us an R and an S value. And then when we verify, we take the R and S value and we'll take the digest and the public key, and we should be able to prove the signature from there. So let's give this a little run. Let's just see if it's running okay. Okay, so in this case, there is a private key, 256 bits. We're using sept256 uh, key one. And there's the public key, which is an X and a Y value uh, together uh, to create that. This then creates the R and the S value. And then we just check that those two values against the hash. And if it works, then ECDSA has, has actually worked. Okay, so you can see there the magic is that we don't need the K value from Alice. Bob can then create a random value every time he wants to sign a hash and it'll create a different signature. What we've got to watch is that we don't reuse K. If we do, then Eve can uh, probably easily hack the signature to get uh, Bob's private key. Okay, so there's an example in there for creating our signature as we saw before. The other type of uh, signature that's popular these days is Ed DSA, and it uses Curve 25519. Uh, the basic theory is here, but it's a, it's a simpler method of creating the signature. And we can do a, a key aggregation. So we can take multiple public keys and, and add them together to create an overall public key. We can also do the same for the signatures. We can sign for each entity and then bring the, the keys together as a single signature. This makes it easier if there are multiple signers of a message to be able to create a single public key uh, for them. So we'll just have a look at that method here as part of this for Ed DSA. Okay, so as I said, this is using curve 25519 uh, to create the uh, Ed 25519 signature from there. Okay, just the same again, we have a public and a private key generated on this curve. Uh, we'll create a hash of it, we'll sign that hash with our private key, and then we'll use our public key and the hash of the message with the signature, the R and the S value. In this case, it's a byte array. If we wanted to, we could take half of it for R and half of it for S. That's the way the signature is created. 
Okay, so we'll just see if we can sign this message here. And I'll just save that here, and then we'll run that one, and we'll see what we get. Okay, so in the case of CUR25519, we actually only record one of the coordinate values uh, because we can derive the other one. So the public and the private key are the same length and not the double that we saw for SEPS256K1. 25, 25, so we only record one of the coordinate values because we can recover the other one. So the keys are even shorter uh, for, the, for the public key. It's the same length as the private key. We create our signature, the R and the S value, as we have before. And all I've done here is parse the first 32 bytes for the R value and, and then the next 32 bytes for the S value because we get a total signature of 64 bytes here in, in this case. And then we can verify and we can see here that the signature actually verifies uh, in this case. Okay, so that's uh, an example there, and you can see the, the code there that actually implements that. As I said, the values that we have uh, here uh, are the parsing of the 64-byte signature value into R and S value, because uh, Alice will have to be able to parse them uh, together to be able to recover them uh, over, over here for the values. Okay, so that's been uh, an overview of uh, Golang and some cryptography covering format, symmetric key, hashing, HMAC, uh, H key derivation function, public encryption and sig signatures. In the next part, I'll go into more detail on some of the deeper methods such as Shamir shares, threshold signatures, crypto pairs, zero knowledge proofs and homomorphic encryption. Thank you.